everybody, and welcome to the latest ARD Consultancy webinar for September with me, Andrew Dawkins, and myself, Rachel Blackhall. Thank yes. you all for joining us. Yes, indeed. It's lovely to have everybody back after the summer break. Hope everybody's had a lovely summer time. Yeah. Yes, it's been quite a while since we last recorded a webinar. So, what we have today is an agenda. Yes, we do. <laughs> there we go. So we have a presentation from um, Jupiter. We hold their European funds in their portfolios and have done so for, gosh, almost, almost 10 years. Yeah, we're 10, 10 years in February, I think. Yes. So today we're very lucky to be joined by fund manager Mark Nichols and Luke Matthews, the sales manager. Yes, yes. I look forward to that. And then on the agenda we have... So we'll do our usual question and answers. Um, as always, if there's anything you want to ask Jupiter, then please type it in as we go. Um, if there's anything for ourselves, again, you can just pop that in the, the chat section as we go along. Um, Jupiter will be leaving us after their presentation, so if there's anything particular, please send that one in early. Then we'll touch on to, what's happening. Oh, we, we should be creating this <laughs> I thought I was doing that line, but I'm so happy. Well, normally I do the what's happening, and then over to you. It's been so long, isn't it? <laughs> We're a bit rusty. <laughs> so what are you doing, Andrew? Well, I'm going to be doing the market update, I think, and then announcing the big prize winner of the Google Reviews competition that we, we ran uh, earlier this month. So I think without further ado, we shall uh, hand over to Luke and Mark at Jupiter. Lovely, thank you very, very much, uh, Andrew and Rachel for having us uh, and welcome guys. Thanks for um, thanks for having us here and thanks for tuning in. Uh, as uh, Rachel and Andrew have uh, alluded to, my, my name is Luke Matthews. I am the sales manager up in the north uh, and Scotland for Jupiter. Uh, and on, me with the call, on the call with me is Mark Nichols, who is a, one of the fund managers of the Jupiter European Fund. Um, I'll just do a very, very quick intro to, to Jupiter, a bit of a history, um, and then without too much further ado, I'll, I'll hand on to Mark, who will go through his philosophy and process very quickly, touch on quite a few sort of stock stories within the fund and, and take you through the, the fund that you, got, you and your clients are, are invested in. So if we just pop over to the first slide, um, just for the history, but very, very quickly, and um, Jupiter has uh, a 35 year long heritage will be uh, yeah running running up to the 40 year anniversary very soon we were founded in 1985 as a specialist boutique and uh, listed on the stock exchange in 1991 continued on as a, a specialist boutique and then commerce bank started acquiring a, uh, a interest in the in Jupiter and around 1995 became full owners in 2000 taking us off the stock exchange however our, our sort of management team uh, led, led a buyout in 2007 which was led by edward bonham carter they then listed back on the stock exchange uh, and uh, a few years later edward stepped back as he um, became chairman um, uh, and uh, we appointed him off to Sledbrook as the ceo there uh, jupiter continued to sort of build um after the management buyout uh, establishing uh, sort of presences across Europe uh, and the rest of the world uh, before Andrew Formica was actually appointed CEO in 2019. Then, just as the pandemic was starting, uh, 2020, uh, Jupiter went through an acquisition of Merion Global Investors, which is actually when I joined Jupiter. Uh, I was part, a part of Merion for about five or six years before, before the acquisition. Uh, I came over in, in to that, that um, finished in July of 2020, so uh, I came over then. Uh, Mark's been running the Jupiter Fund for the last, coming up to two-year uh, anniversary for, for him as well. So just moving on to, to the next page very, very quickly, just to give you a, uh, a Jupiter at a glance. Uh, we have about 60, 60 billion uh, under management. It's split there. Uh, you guys will, I'm sure, get the presentation after if you want to take a closer look. But without further ado, the, the sort of uh, main event, I will hand over to Mark to take you through a little bit how he runs money, his philosophy process, and then some stock stories as well. Uh, so if I could move on to the next slide, and then I'll hand over to Mark. Uh, 
Great, great. Thanks, Luke. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, good news. We're short whoever uh, Webinar Ninja are. Um, no, we're not. Um, let's let's move forward and start just start briefly with the next slide. I'm, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the team and, and uh, the background uh, and then spend most of the time talking about uh, some of the holdings, why we like them um, and what the portfolio looks like uh, today. And then very happy to take some questions uh, at the end of this. Um, Luke, if you can still hear me, if if uh, I drop off or there's any problem with the audio, please just drop me a, a text. Um, will and do. I will uh, uh, refresh my connection. Um, so that's the team. Uh, you've got five individuals, um, Mark and myself um, leading the team. We came across um, together, had previously worked at Threadneedle, um, managing the small cap, uh, small mid cap products in Mark's case, and the uh, large cap European products in my case, uh, and we brought across uh, Phil McCartney and uh, Sohil Chotai, both also from uh, Threadneedle previously. Um, Phil, having spent most of his time there on the uh, UK team, uh, and Sohil having been on the European team, working directly with initially Mark Keslop and then. Uh, subsequently alongside me on the European Select Fund. And uh, we brought in Nikisha. She joined uh, alongside Luke as part of the uh, Merian transaction. We have a team of uh, five um, on the ESG side. That uh, team of five is about to become uh, six. They are uh, pretty well integrated into our research process. So when we um, come up with a new idea, when we do a piece of work, uh, as an investment team looking at stocks, uh, we will tend to ask them to provide an ESG overview uh, that then forms part of the, the the investment process and part of the discussion on where risks uh, and opportunities lie in any uh, particular idea. Um, on the next slide, uh, slide number five, a bit of background on the track record. So on the left-hand side, this is Mark Heslop's uh, track record. Uh, and on the right hand side, it's uh, my track record uh, investing in the European space. Um, of course, these, um, what does this show you? Well, it shows you that, that Mark and I have been doing this for uh, a number of decades um, as fund managers. And prior to that, we both worked as analysts. Uh, we both worked on, on the buy side and the sell side. So there's um, cumulatively uh, about four decades between the two of us uh, spent in, in European markets. Uh, and then we add on top the, the, um, the experience of the rest of the team. But it also shows you that we've got a track record of adding value uh, right across the market cap spectrum in, in the European equity space. Uh, and so as co-managers, uh, we think that the sum of the parts adds up to, uh, or the sum of our cumulative uh, experience and the fact we've done that together should add up to, to uh, something more than one plus one equaling two. Um, we should be able to have better coverage of the entire universe to seek out those new opportunities. And we would say our, our sweet spot probably is in the in what we describe as the mid cap space, somewhere in the five to 30 billion uh, euro market cap range. So we're not generally uh, fishing in, in the very largest companies in Europe, uh, we're also generally not uh, particularly exposed to the smallest companies in Europe. We're in the liquid mid-market. Um, and that's been the case for um, most of our careers. Uh, skipping forward to slide number six, please. Um, here's the brief overview of what we're trying to achieve. We are bottom-up stock pickers. Um, we don't um, buy macroeconomic trends. Uh, we don't try and understand central bankers. Um, plenty of people do that. There are plenty of data points. Uh, we don't try and uh, analyze commodity prices, moves in commodity prices. We're not experts on what OPEC are doing. We're all about understanding industry uh, competition and the microeconomics of the businesses in which uh, we're investing or thinking about investing. And ultimately, we're looking for those businesses that we can buy and hold where we think the industry structure and the fundamentals of the business will allow it to deliver returns on capital that are well in excess of the cost of capital for a, a long period of time in the future. When we're asked about investment horizons, we often talk about three to five years, but to be perfectly frank, uh, forever is a great holding period, as long as the price always leaves the opportunity of, of upside, as long as the valuation doesn't become 
overly stretched relative to other opportunities in the marketplace. And so ultimately, we, we end up with a fairly concentrated, fairly high conviction portfolio of companies. It's in the 35 to 45 names range at the moment. It's, I believe it's 37 stocks. Um, and those companies uh, tend to have a characteristic of high barriers to entry, sustainable competitive advantage, access to uh, secular growth rather than cyclical growth. And they tend to be run by highly competent management teams that understand that the cash in the business ultimately belongs to you, it belongs to shareholders. It's not there to, to facilitate some kind of um, ego building or empire building exercise uh, for, the, for the people in charge of the, the capital allocation decisions within the company. Um, just to add on briefly in terms of characteristics, uh, what, what that also means when you're buying these type of companies, um, they tend to produce quite consistently significant amounts of cash flow. Companies that produce a lot of cash flow uh, tend not to be um, carrying lots of financial leverage. So uh, when we've had uh, major losses in European equity markets over the last few decades, typically it's been about uh, the balance sheet side of things going wrong. Typically, it's not always the case, it's not a guarantee of course, but typically these companies um, don't face that sort of systemic risk around uh, financing. They are not dependent on debt markets to operate and to function. They are self-sustaining franchises, and that means you also tend not to see equity dilution, um, uh, removing one of the risks of a transfer of value from equity holders to other stakeholders within uh, within the business. And it's also fair to say that when we find these types of companies, they tend to be offering some kind of service or product that's desirable, not just in a single country or a single market, but on a global basis. And so we would tend to think about the secular growth opportunities in our businesses on a global basis. It's right to say that we have more European economic exposure within the portfolio as a European fund uh, than you would find typically in, in a global portfolio. Uh, but we also tend to have less European exposure than you would find in the index, principally because, because some of the things we avoid are limited by um, national boundaries. So telecoms providers, utilities companies, et cetera, um, tend not to feature in the portfolio and tend to be heavily overweight domestic uh, revenues, but they also tend to be uh, underweight growth. So, um, you, you know, there's natural selection in there. Um, the next slide is just a vis visual rep representation of the types of uh, financial characteristics we're looking for in businesses. So returns well in excess of the cost of capital and businesses that aren't subject to, to those returns coming down to the cost of capital in the near future. Uh, so we're avoiding this pattern of the, the blue line coming down. And on the right hand side, we want businesses that, that generate higher returns as they grow. So in other words, they're leveraging a brand or some sort of um, competitive advantage in the business, a network effect, for example, uh, and using that to drive returns up, not to, to move towards commoditization. On the next slide, uh, and I would say all of these are, you know, maybe worth going back and having a look at in a bit more detail if you, if you want to afterwards, uh, or may prompt some questions later on. When we talk about sustainable competitive advantage and barriers to entry, what, where, what are the sources of that? We've tried to give uh, a visual representation on the left-hand side. And when we talk about industry structures and the kind of things we like in a business, we do that through the lens of a Porter's Five Forces model. We understand how companies may face pricing pressure or new, new competition. Uh, and where we don't find uh, that sort of uh, competition coming into the market, of course, we have a stable industry structure and the potential to generate high attractive economic returns on the franchise we're investing in. Um, so I promised we'd get on to the juicy stuff. Um, the next slide it, it, we can show briefly, but but skip over it uh, for the most part. This is where the growth's coming from. If it's not about macroeconomics and uh, what the central banks are doing and interest rates and so on, this for us is what it's about, decade plus uh, structural growth trends uh, and trying to access these. We have a decent exposure right across this uh, broad selection. And the first company uh, I want to highlight on slide 10 to you, hopefully is extremely familiar to everyone. Um, you know, there's a there's a logo there on the top right hand side, the three stripes. I think most of us will know Adidas. Um, we probably most of us know the history as well. Uh, Adi Dassler uh, set the company up. Um, he created those iconic uh, black and white football boots. 
that had the three stripes on them. It's a brand with heritage. We like we like that. Um, it's a brand with global resonance. We like that as well. Um, but these are not sufficient um, to drive an investment case. So it's a good starting point, having a strong brand. But how do you sustain a strong brand? You have to innovate. So this is also a business that's got a great track record of creating new products. Um, you can see that in the lineup of shoes they have at the moment. The, um, the Ultra Boost uh, sole was a huge win for them. Of course, that built on the heritage of products like the Stan Smith. Um, and more recently, they've come up with a light strike sole that's been uh, winning records in half marathons and uh, the, the longer cross-country distances. Um, and that, that goes to the idea that when you marry high performance um, products that are seen in professional sports that are used by elite athletes, it demonstrates the level of investment that's going into the product. And that subsequently has a trickle down effect into whether it's amateur athletes or whether it's into lifestyle uh, footwear or apparel. Of course, there's also significant investment in things like uh, soccer teams, football teams, I guess, probably to this audience. Um, you know, you'll see, um, interestingly enough, Cristiano Ronaldo is now wearing um, the Adidas uh, stripes as he as he plies his trade for his domestic club. Um, uh, and again, that will uh, draw consumers in. Uh, this is a tough industry to operate in. There is a lot of competition. We're always asked about new brands coming along, ON, uh, running shoes, um, Vija with their sort of organic proposition. Um, scale, however, represents a huge barrier to success. So your audience is global. Serving your audience means having uh, low cost production and efficient supply chains that allow you to access all consumers all around the world to capture all of the growth you can um, and it means doing that in an on-time on basis. And you're also doing it in an omni-channel world. So whether that's through a retail partner, a JD Sports, a Foot Locker, some of these names on the high street you'd be familiar with, um, or whether it's doing it through online channels with partners such as Zalando uh, for the European market or Amazon potentially uh, across um, UK and US markets, uh, or whether it's your own D to C offering. There's huge complexity in getting the product from A to B, making sure you have stock everywhere, making sure you aren't disappointing any of your partners. Um, and then that channel shift presents an opportunity if you're at scale. So when a, when a consumer goes to the Adidas website, they go there because they want an Adidas branded product, whether it's shoes or, or uh, apparel. Ultimately, what that's doing is it's lowering the marketing expense. In other words, consumers are coming because they're familiar with the brand, not because they're um, not because you have more shelf space in the retailer and are nearer the door or at the right eye level or whatever it used to be the differentiating uh, feature. Um, and it also means you're paying away less of your IP to a third party. You have more control of your own brand and you have more control of your own pricing proposition. What that means is more full price sales, less wastage in, from your inventory, uh, and that should translate into higher margins, uh, better branding and higher prices in the long run. So um, unfortunately, if you want to buy a new pair of Adidas trainers, the prices probably have been going up over the last few years uh, and will probably continue to do so. Um, so Adidas has always been a commercial success. They've grown their revenues um, around 10% for the last 15 years, 10% per annum around the last 15 years. Um, people are often surprised that, that the growth rate's been that high. Well, they've tended to outperform the broader industry using that brand power uh, and the scale of their supply chain and their effectiveness and their reach to capture the growth wherever it is. Um, but populations are growing. Um, wealth is growing in particularly Asian markets. Um, and so this is a, a company full of potential, potential for growth. Uh, and potential for margin expansion at the same time. So if you think this business can sustain double digit revenue growth, it should be sustaining profit growth in excess of that. We think this is all a great starting point uh, for an investment um, and Adidas is a significant position within the portfolio. Um, more briefly, just on a couple of uh, names within the fund, a completely different one on the next slide. This is a, um, 
B2B company called IMCD. It's right in the mid cap space. So market cap is in the uh, five to 10 billion bracket. Plenty liquid enough uh, for, the, for the assets we manage. Um, and it's, as I said, it's a B2B proposition. So not a name generally people are familiar with. Um, what does it do? It's a specialty chemical distributor. Sounds extremely dull. Uh, but when you get into the specialty chemical market, distribution is not about having an Amazon type, uh, all things to all people proposition and scale is not the only differentiating feature. Ultimately, the customers are very small. There are exclusive supply arrangements. The more suppliers you sign up, the more the customers have to come to you, the more customers you have, the more reach you have, the more the suppliers depend on you. It's a critical part of the value chain Ultimately, what's happening is the customers are going into labs dotted around the world um, and IMCD is taking its supply base of specialty chemicals to come up with interesting formulas, whether that's for a new beverage, whether it's a delivery system for a, a new medicine. Think about how uh, medicines are delivered. Um, the worst way is a needle. Um, the best way is probably a pleasant tasting syrup, um, but not all things work for all products. Um, IMCD has an opportunity, therefore, to add value to its customers and to offer ease and productivity to its suppliers. So on both sides of the value chain, it um, creates value and has an important role to play. They are also out in, in the world consolidating the market uh, and, and looking to expand their reach across North America and Asia from a European base. Uh, we've owned IMCD for about a decade um, it's been one of our best performers, particularly over the year to date period, um, and um, is a good example of the kind of business we might hold outside of um, consumer facing brands. Uh, and wrapping up um, on slide 12, just with the examples, there's another one hopefully you've heard of. Um, Pena Ricard is the world's second largest uh, spirits producer behind Diageo, uh, listed in France. Uh, Pena and Ricard are, of course, the two. Um, two dominant brands in the French market. But this is a portfolio of brands right across product categories. So they go from aged products like scotch and um, cognac uh, right through to light spirits, uh, such as um, absolute vodka, beefy to gins, um, through to long drinks and mixes, things like Lillet, if you've been out for the aperitif market, as it seems like uh, everyone else on the planet has over the last few weeks as, as um We've seen reopening and, and sunshine, um, Lillet and Tonic. Apparently that's very popular. Um, if anyone's looking for a suggestion, that's a Peno brand. Uh, and they're also in the champagne space. So uh, the, the iconic um, Perrier Jouet Belle Epoque bottle um, uh, has a fascinating 200 year history of design and was apparently Oscar Wilde's favorite drink, uh, if you want any any uh, recommendation from the 19th century, um, which, you know, when it comes to drinks is, is um, proof of longevity of the brand, if, if nothing else. Um, but why is this interesting to us? Well, yes, it's European in terms of its listing, but 40% of its revenues comes from its three biggest markets. Those three biggest markets are the USA, China, and India, all very different propositions. The USA is the biggest profit pool in drinks. They're things like rum, are um, significant categories. India uh, drinks roughly half the world's whiskey, believe it or not. Um, and every year there are 20 million individuals that um, come to legal uh, drinking age in India. So if, the, if you think about where they're coming from, if you think about the UK, a population of 60 million people, um, India is quite a significant opportunity for this business. It's quite a significant growth opportunity. Um, so we're also talking about in China and India, high, high growth, significant wealth creation, um, and we're talking about low penetration of Western branded products. So less than 1% of the Indian market is, is um, represented by Scotch or international whiskies, for example. It's all local brands. There are only two big players in the market, Diageo and Perno own them. Um, and for China, less than a half a percent of the volume of uh, spirits consumed is chi in China is imported. So basically, it's a baiju market, um, which is a kind of rice wine type product. Um, and yet they have a nice taste for cognac. And the barriers to entry in cognac are massive. Around 90% of all the purchases of the eau de vie, the raw material, are locked up by the four biggest brands that you'd be familiar with. Um, and around 98% of the aged stocks of cognac sit with those four brands. 
an incredibly challenging proposition to, to even build a starting position in that market. The fifth biggest purchaser of O de V, by the way, is Grand Marnier. Um, so when you see some of these niche cognac brands out there, they are absolutely tiny by volume. Um, so a completely dominant player, huge position in global markets, again, significant reach and significant growth potential through a well-managed and innovative portfolio of brands, very characteristic of the kind of thing we'd look for. Um, and I will leave you, um, my final comments on slide 13, uh, which is a snapshot of the portfolio structure. It shows you some of the things I've been talking about, high conviction, obviously demonstrated in the position sizes, in the deviation from the benchmark on the bottom left-hand side by sector, um, the deviation in terms of the revenue exposure by region. So remember I, I mentioned underweight Europe relative to the benchmark, more global in nature, uh, and smaller than the, the benchmark in terms of the average uh, market cap weighting in the portfolio, but still very liquid, uh, and we don't use cash. That's the portfolio. There is a style chart on the next slide. Um, again, it really just emphasizes the points I've been making, uh, overweight growth quality, um, underweight cheap companies that, that are exposed to uh, commoditization where there is no real growth proposition and where we do not find the returns profile attractive. That is a race through the Jupiter European Fund. I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, I'm also very happy uh, to, to receive any questions um, after this is over and, and hear from you. If you have any questions or concerns and we can follow up. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a, a very enjoyable presentation. Thank you very much for that. Just uh, one quick question we got in before the presentation started there was, uh, with the effects of uh, COVID, has that changed the, the, the investment style at all? hasn't changed the investment style. Uh, it's clearly changed a little bit of the flavor of the, the companies that we hold on an underlying basis. Um, but of course, at the same time, oh, can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Screens just changed. Sorry. Yes. Um, so things like Amadeus, for example, Amadeus um, provides the booking systems for airlines and for hotels. Uh, they thought they were diversifying by going away from the airline industry and toward ho towards the uh, hotels and hospitality industry. And it turns out, um, obviously, they concentrated their exposure to COVID uh, all at the same time. So it doesn't look very clever. At the same time, it, it, it you know, so the position size due to, due to performance, due to some reductions we made at the time came down. Um, we're now in a position where we're looking at something where we think it's a second order uh, beneficiary of reopening. So people aren't flying at the moment, they're going to bars, so Perno wins. But but beyond bars reopening, we think flights come back, we think there's huge pent up demand for travel, uh, domestic and international, uh, and they should be a significant beneficiary of that. And they should they should also benefit in terms of their market share. So um, in a basically a three player industry, the third player is financially compromised, let's say. And all our conversations with, with Amadeus suggest uh, they've been able to continue investing through the crisis and, and leverage the balance sheet strength to win some some market share. So that sort of initially came down in terms of weight of the portfolio, things that are, uh, are more exposed to that second order effect, um, still haven't seen that snap back. Those are the kind of names at the moment where we're uh, considering increasing the exposure within the portfolio. Um, but But I suppose the other way of answering the question is to say that you know, if your target is to find high quality franchises, some have been more exposed to COVID, some less exposed to COVID. But broadly speaking, they've outcompeted their peers. So even if your overall market in the case of Adidas was down 40 or 50 percent at the peak of disruption, um, it was an opportunity to push out some of the weaker players from the industry. And even if Nike was gaining share on the industry, Adidas was capable of doing that as well. And it puts them in a better position to, to capture more of the growth when things reopen. So it's not it's not been quite as simple as just saying COVID good, COVID bad for the various businesses. It's it's thinking through the the changes that creates and the competitive dynamic, uh, and of course the response the business will have in whatever the new normal happens to look like. Um, you know whether we see that in 2022 or, or beyond. That's lovely. Well, th thank you very much for that, uh, that description. That's uh, very, very uh, useful to, to hear. And thank you very much. And uh, also, thank you for the, this uh, presentation. And thank you to, to Luke for joining us. And 
privilege to have the, the, the top yeah, people from appreciate your time. No problem. No Thanks problem. very much for having we'll, us, guys. We'll leave you Thank now. You. I hope the rest of it goes well. Thanks. Thank Cheers. You Thank much. you. Bye. There we go. Lovely. So. Back to us now. Yes, indeed. There we are. Uh, so, what's been happening What's happening here? here? Um, so, we are now all back working in the main office in Falkirk, which is lovely. Um, on another positive front is that after a year and a half, over a year and a half, we're now welcoming clients back into the office for face-to-face -face meetings. So um, what I will say is that we are trying to just limit the number of people that we have in just to try and keep everybody safe. So if anybody does require a face-to-face -face meeting, then please get in touch because the appointment slots are booking up quite in advance now. So um, we're obviously carrying on with Zoom and telephone. I think that will probably be around for quite a while but um yeah it's, it's great to see great to see clients back in the office so that's a big positive for us yes i think the only thing that we're not doing now is making drinks yes so there's still some restrictions so you can bring your own drinks in and uh there's no amount of tea milk no sugar <laughs> yeah that's true um i don't think there's really a great deal else on that front one thing we do want to bring to your attention is um, another company rebranding. So many of you will be aware of company Standard Life. Um, they have now regrouped and changed their name to Aberdeen. You'll see the, the new logo on screen there. It's pronounced Aberdeen. So yeah, not sure why, but um, this will be communicated to anybody who has any investments or pensions with Standard Life. Um, also, as many of you may be aware, we're currently going through the portfolio rebalance. So we have reviewed the investment funds and things. So you'll likely get some communication after that takes place, probably just confirmation of the changes that have been made. So I'd imagine that paperwork will refer to Aberdeen. So just so you know, that, that's exactly what it's about. Um, yeah, so on the portfolio rebalance front, Andrew, do you want to give a recap? Yeah, so just to, to bring it up to date. So the, this is in relation to the portfolios, which uh, a number of you will hold. Um, some people don't, but uh, we concentrate on the portfolios uh, most of because it gives you an idea of the, the way the market's moving. So our uh, five portfolios we run, portfolio cautious and defensive. There's no change at all. All the funds are doing uh, above average, really, and no need to change allocation rates or anything else about it. And the balanced capital growth and aggressive portfolio is getting a wee makeover that uh, happy to say no investment funds are being replaced, but what we are doing is bringing a new UK equity fund into the mix. Using the uh, Sanford Deland Buffetology Fund, which uh, is a UK equity fund, as we mentioned, it's got a small holding, it's around about 38 different companies, and it works slightly differently from the two Lion Trust funds that we have. And the Lion Trust funds are slightly, slightly larger, um, special situations fund, and then the smaller companies fund. So this will be joining the team, and that change will be going forward. Now, one thing we need to, to remind you, if you haven't already, if you could kindly reply to us and say, yes, you're happy for the changes to be made, because we can't make any changes without your consent. So if you email or you can do a telephone call or send us a teletext or a pigeon, what else yes. would we say? So Smoke signals are acceptable. <laughs> Alison is working very hard at the moment. I'm sure many of you will have probably already received the email with the link to our video where we just explain in a little bit more detail about this fund um, and the reasons why we want to include it. So most of you should have had that already. If not, it will be out by the end of the day today. So there's some weekend viewing for you. If you just have a look at it, if there's any questions at all, just get back to us, let us know, I'm more than happy to answer those. And if you just want to go ahead, just please, yeah, get back to us, email, phone, as Andrew mentioned, smoke signals, however you want to do it, just give us the go ahead because we can't make any changes until you have approved it. So yeah, the communications will be out, which just explain it all. Um, and we'll make those changes for you. I think that's, that's good. That sort of covers covers the most recent things that we're doing. Um, and we'll be on to yeah. the market update. 
Yes, so what we're going to do now is we'll, we'll run our video, uh, which is actually on the YouTube's channel. So if, uh, if you want to uh, tune into the, the YouTube's and you, you, you get a, an update from all the videos that we've done over the years. And um, here we put down uh, details of the performance of the fight for us over the last five years. And uh, we, we're pleased to say that probably from, from the next week or two, we'll be also showing the performance over the last 10 years, which is uh, even more impressive. It could get any better. So what we'll do now is uh, you can uh, watch the watch the video for a second or two, and then we'll be right back after the video has run to tell you the winner of our fantastic competition. Hello, and um, sorry about that uh, break. I was just making a cup of tea because that, that got me in the mood for a, for a drink on the top of my coffee and tea. Um, no, we're, uh, we're, we're actually broadcasting this over four different from di four different locations, and uh, sometimes we have a bit of an issue when we're trying to run videos, etc. So apologies for that, but uh, if you're watching this on catch up, there's been no issues at all. <laughs> Rachel. So pick up where we left off. Um, Google reviews. We can't thank you all enough um, for so many of the clients that have gone on and left um, glowing reviews of the service that you've received from ARDs. It really is so appreciated. Um, it's great because it encourages so many potential new clients to, to pick up the phone and engage with us and, and benefit from financial advice. We can help so many more people because it's real comments from real people um, and that's exactly what they say to us. So it's it's great for us, it encourages us to um, sort of put ourselves out there and then help a lot more people and it definitely encourages people to engage with financial advice that perhaps thought that they wouldn't have ever done that before. So we're so thankful for everybody who took the time to leave us a review and um, with a bit of a push there to try and get to 100 reviews, which happened a lot quicker than we expected. Yes, that's brilliant. Uh, one point to note before we go on to the prize winner is that um, two missing reviewers. The, yes. Yeah. Indeed. My mom, <laughs> my mom and your mom. <laughs> and my own. So yes, we'll be getting, getting told. <laughs> right. So anyway, we we ran a competition and we said what we're going to do is for everybody that's written us a, a review, all one hundred of you, we're going to put all of you into a, a, a prize draw and we're going to choose a, a winner by random and. Uh, 
the winner will get £500 for his or her own use and then £500 to no, donate to a charity of their choice. So we will run the video for the prize winner. So, very well done, Alan Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> Alan D, we we shall be making contact with you very shortly to uh, to, to give you your winnings and uh, to find out what charity you're going to donate. So, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to everybody. And um, so that's really it for for today. Thank yeah. you for being with us, and uh, it's lovely to get uh, Jupiter involved there. And our next webinar is scheduled for November. So. Um, if there's anything at all you want to hear from, it might be about a particular fund, or if it's not fund related at all, then um, let us know. Andrew and I will see what we can come up with. That's lovely. So uh, thank you again for your time, and we look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you. Thank you.